Thank you. I, I apologize for standing room only, but everybody really wants to see Julia Bulet um, this hour. So let me read a little bit of bio and then we'll have a guest come on in. So this uh, episode is The Scandal's Life and Death of Virginia City's Julia Bulet. Virginia City is most notorious working girl will share her own words how her scandalous death shocked the Comstock mining town, divided its citizens into their quest to find and punish her murderer. And let me introduce Julia Hewitt. My name is Julia Boulet. My friends, they call me Jules. How will you call me? Well, my, if this isn't the Society for the Prevention or for the Protection of Odd Antiquities, I've got one for you. Mrs. Eileen Bowers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to see you all here today as I do have something to share with you. This afternoon I have a very important meeting with Mr. William Sharon. Oh, don't you roll your eyes at me. I know what folks say about him and it, it could be true that he would sell his own mother for a brick of silver. But do you realize that through my acquaintance with him, I could be gifted stock in the yellow jacket mine? What's a little small talk, champagne and recreation? when it could mean my entire future. Now, don't you breathe a word of this to anyone, but I sometimes wonder about how much longer I can live by my profession. Well, at the age of 34, I well know my days are numbered, and I know what can happen to the likes of me. That Cad Thompson is very fortunate to have the brick house and the girls that work for her. I think she was quite a looker in her day. One option, I suppose, would to to be a domestic, but really, why would anyone want to slave away day and night for someone like that eccentric Eileen Bow? Really. But women here on the Comstock do not have many options for earning a living. Well, if you're not married with hordes of children hanging off your hips, and you can you have very few options except to be a, a domestic, a laundress, a seamstress, or a proprietor of a boarding house or a working girl. <laughs> do you ever long for adventure? Well, I sometimes do. I remember when Nevada was only a territory and not yet a state. Well, that was just a few short years ago, but the good times had yet to come to Virginia, including me. Oh, and those Pony Express riders, the adventures they had, the dangers they faced. I admit, I have a passionate fondness for one pony, Bob Haslam. He was the most famous of all the Pony Express riders, with the fastest time ever. Now that he works for Wells Fargo and Express Company, I do get to see him when he comes to town from time to time. Oh no, I've never met him. He rides into town, he rides out of town just as fast as he comes in. But if I ever got my hands on him, just what wouldn't I do? That's a real man. Now, how come you don't have a bow? Pretty girls such as yourself, the thousands of men here on the Comstock, and you without a one of them? Choose wisely, though. You wouldn't want to have to share him with someone like me. But then again, you wouldn't want someone like that miraculously ignorant Sandy Bowers, as Mark Twain once called him. <laughs> Do you know that his stuffy old wife actually thinks that I have eyes for her husband? I so enjoy watching her bristle like a porcupine every time I insinuate that I do. Now there's a saying. Nature, who has made the perfect rose and bird, has yet to make the full and perfect man. I don't know who said that, but it's true. Now I know there are there, those of you out there that do not approve of my use of laudanum. Why? It's not as if I'm addicted to opiates. Why, laudanum is very useful at keeping my headaches at bay and certain other discomforts. 
I tire of those hypocritical parlor cats who tout the evils of laudanum and opium as if whiskey were any better. Absolutely not. On more than one occasion, I have witnessed Dan DeQuill demoralized by his love of the drink. If the Territorial Enterprise readers ever knew how often his editorials were written by Alf Doton instead, when Dan couldn't make his way to the office the next day. And speaking of demoralized drinking, why that Brendan Timothy Michael O'Donovan, why he can put away whisker, whiskey faster than anyone I know. <laughs> All right. <coughs> I know I was not really actually invited to this event, but I figure. If you all can take my money, you can bear my company. <laughs> As I look around me at all of these women of society, culture, and wealth, I question, what is wealth? When one is wealthy, one could live the good and clean life. But is it always a clean road to wealth? I, for one, desire fine and pretty things, to be sure. But can I not also be wealthy in friends and admirers? I may not live in the grandest of homes or wear the finest of jewels, but I am I not also able to attend society events by way of operas and balls? I may not own 30 gowns, but I own several well-made and beautiful gowns that serve me and are not wasted in my closet. I've never really ever had to want for anything. I've always been clever enough to align myself with those who could provide for me adequately. Yes, my road from New Orleans to Virginia has had its bends and curves. Why, in San Francisco, I experienced such filth and debauchery I barely could stand it. Well, there, earthquakes and fires were a regular occurrence. And my business was in low-rent neighborhoods and boarding houses. The low fees I was forced to charge, I simply had to move on. Now, that's when I left for Weaverville. It was in Weaverville where things finally turned around for me. There I was sometimes paid in gold pieces as I had always dreamed. And I was considered a little more elevated than my counterparts. Well, it was in Weaverville where I was finally able to give back to my community. That is outside of my profession. <laughs> I would donate to charities and I nursed the sick from time to time, but it was a town that when things slowed down, one simply had to move on. So I left for Carson and then came here to Virginia. Now, dirt. Dirt depends on your point of view. How you deal with dirt and when you deal with it is up to you as well. Dirt washes off. I simply have reached the, ch the place where I have the freedom to make choices, and I am not ashamed of how I have obtained my wealth. Shame is a dirt more difficult to wash off than any other. Take that Bowers woman, for instance. <laughs> she thinks I should be ashamed of who and what I am. Why? I do for her friends' husbands what they would not because their moralistic upbringing has taught them to be ashamed of enjoying anything too much. Poor Mrs. Bowers. She probably will never know how much fun getting dirty can be. <laughs> <laughs> now, some folks like that wealthy Mrs. Bowers, so-called queen of the Comstock, think that material wealth gives one an exclusive right to enjoy culture and society events. It just tickles me to, turn, to see her turn pea green every time she finds me or my kind at an opera or ball. My escorts are her society, and sometimes her friend's husbands. <laughs> <laughs> she works tirelessly to bring culture and society to this godforsaken, lawless, crime-ridden, diseased, and debauched Wild West town. <laughs> All the while trying to keep the undeserving, such as myself, separate from her and her friends, only to find that she cannot control every aspect of life here on the Comstock. Why, you'd think she was going to catch syphilis from one of us every time she brushed near. <laughs> I ask you, how possible is it to bring culture and society to a town where everyone must arm themselves with a gun and bowie knife. And too much drink puts it to use far too often. 
gambling and betting on anything that moves is a main attraction to be sure. The majority of the citizens of this town have come here to work in a thankless death trap called the mines, day and night, night and day. The reality is most won't ever see their families in the old states again. Lonely and violent men who drink too much, gamble too much, and cruise D Street too much. <laughs> A rough clay to mold into fine porcelain? Ha! I feel very fortunate to be able to travel in all circles of society. Well, maybe not all circles. There was that, that, in, that awkward evening when a miner, Doyle Harris, escorted me to the grand opening gala of the newly built Bowers Mansion. <laughs> I declare, we were not there 10 minutes before that Mrs. Bowers nearly came unwound. Under no circumstances was a working girl, prostitute, doxy whore gonna muddy her fine marble floors. We were summarily tossed out, and back to Virginia we went. I didn't mind so much, however. We had more fun, just the two of us, anyway. <laughs> Life isn't all about society. Why, I tend to the injured and sick working girls, and the miners as well. And I stand side by side with the boys of Virginia Company Number 1 as they fight the all too frequent fires that <coughs> plague this tinder box of a city. And I work hard at my profession. How much longer do I have before my hair turns gray and wrinkles map my face? For now, I do enjoy society events by way of attendant offers and balls. And I behave in a cultured manner as I was taught by my Uncle Jules. I read well, and I am aware of worldly issues, much more so than any of those old birds in their gilded cages up on A Street. <laughs> I do not play it light. I live it. And I keep my nose out of business that is not my own. That Bowers cow would do well to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was a time when I was 16, when my regard for family and morals was little to non-existent. I admit, I did not fully understand the importance of family. My desires fell upon the want of fine clothes, travel, and the flattery of men. Family, in my family, Women married very young, bore many children, and then died of yellow fever, like my own mother when I was very small. As a brilliant young quadroon, many folks call us mulattoes, what chance at refined society did I have? I saw my only fate as picking cotton and tending to the motherless children of my father and uncles. Why, it was my own Uncle Jules who set me up in business and taught me to be fluent in current affairs, literature and music, and worldly topics, all with a genteel approach as not to offend any gentleman. Dear, after, after a while, my cousin Paul joined us. Jules was away attending to his affairs, and dear Paul was like a brother to me. Why, we traveled from San Francisco to Sacramento to the gold field mining towns near Angel's Camp. Later, we moved to Carson City. Paul came here to work at the Ophir Mine, and I stayed in Carson with my dear friend, Annie Smith. Annie is Hank Monk's girl. Why, my clientele were long ranchers, politicians of Carson Valley. Did I ever miss my home back in Louisiana? Well, distance does lend enchantment to the view. And I was all alone when tragedy struck and poor Paul was killed in a cave in at the Ophir. Well, after that, I could not face the world without the help of the laudanum. Laudanum soothes a multitude of grievances. And laudanum is also society's dirty little secret. There are as many or more laudanum users here in society as there are on the road. And family. Family meaning a faithful husband and sickly children, I declare, who here on the Comstock has an original family? Why, I have helped more of my friends bury their children than watch them take their first steps. If I ever met the right man who wanted to settle down with me, marry me, and bear his children, I would think about it hesitantly. Only Thomas Peasley 
has ever made me come close to wanting to be devoted to just one man. First fire chief in Nevada and foreman of Virginia Company Number One. Abolitionist, Catholic, and strong unionist. Why, he was tall, rugged, and strikingly good looking. He had a seductive smile and penetrating blue eyes. We were hopelessly in love for the first time in our lives and we did give some consideration to marriage. While we never openly flaunted our relationship, it was widely understood that we were devoted to one another. It was Tom that after the violent death of my dear friend, Jesse Lester, he cheered me up by making me an honorary member of Virginia Company Number One. Why, I had a new purpose in life, and I took my appointment very seriously. After I learned the news that my dear Tom had been savagely attacked, violently murdered by his rival, Martin Barnhart, I was inconsolable. I could not attend his funeral, and I lived in a stupor of brandy and laudanum for weeks. Aside from my love for Tom, I have never wanted to be a mother, nor have I wanted to take care of another man's home while he ran around town with someone like me. <laughs> <laughs> Queen of the Comstock? No. I want to be remembered as queen of good times. <laughs> well, it was on January 20th of 1967 that I, would obtain, that I would reach that status that I so desired, not that I would be around to enjoy it any. It, I owe it to the newspapers and the editors like my friend Alf Doton for their description of my brutal murder and my sensational life for such a grand turnout at my funeral. What led to it, however, is not to be recommended as a desirable road to fame. <laughs> or is it infamy? I never remember. It was a cold January night, and I had just the one customer, a miner, and after he left, I was, I was reflecting on the gifts my friend Annie Smith had given me that day a watch Hank had given her, and a pair of earrings which needed repair. Now as I began to dress, I heard my back door open, and then it slammed shut. And after that, what happened next is only a blur. I remember the struggle. I was pinned down on my bed, and I must have fought violently, as I was bludgeoned twice on my head by my own piece of firewood. After that, my world swam away from me. I could not breathe, and my efforts grew weak. Finally, I gave in, and my life slipped away forever into the darkness. It was shortly after midnight, January 20th of 1867, and I had just recently celebrated my 34th birthday. Now, as I lay there uh, departed from this world, I'll be damned if that blackguard did not run but stayed on to rob me of everything that I had of value, all while my body grew cold just a few feet away. Isn't it ironic that in the end, my life was not worth a single penny? Now the good boys of Virginia Company Number 1 put on a wonderful funeral for me, paid for the entire affair they did. Why, flowers, a casket, and a hearse, and it was a grand turnout. Why, all, every man and doxy was in attendance. <laughs> of course, the good, pious women of Virginia stayed home and shuttered their windows. They were incensed that anyone could celebrate my life, especially their own husbands. <laughs> well, no firemen minded contributing to the event. Of course, it was a year or so later when they were repaid. My very good friend, Mary Jane Minnery, was only able to collect $875 from my entire state, 64 of which was still owed beyond that. Granted, 149 of it would not have been necessary had I not needed to be buried. So, is that what my life was worth to my murderer? Around $800? And who was my murderer? 
If I saw his face clearly, I do not recall. John Millian claimed that he was a lookout for two gentlemen by the name of Douglas and Dillon, that he didn't even know I was murdered until the very next day. If so, what happened to these two gentlemen? And why did they not return to get my belongings back from Millian? Was it because of the immediate outcry for vigilante justice? Who knows? And what was Millian's life worth? A French-speaking foreigner who worked at odd jobs around Virginia. A mere shadow of the soldier who once fought in the Crimean War. If it is as Millian says, why would Douglas and Dillon need to need a lookout for the two of them? As I've said, I do not remember much, but I do not recall a second man in my room. Now, if Millian acted alone, was he really clever enough to plan an attack and a robbery, knowing that he would have to wait several months before he began to sell off my possessions? And regardless, how could he have ever imagined that my dresses and my one-of-a-kind jewelry pieces would not be recognized around the Comstock? Ironically, John Millian sat in a jail cell charged with attacking another prostitute in a drunken rage when they charged him with my murder after they found my possessions in a trunk that he owned that he had stored with a friend of his. So there, in a jail cell, sat Millian, awaiting a trial that would be over with before it began. You see, he did not understand very much English and he was denied an interpreter. There was the circumstantial evidence of my belongings in his possession, that and his confession to at least being the lookout, but it seemed he did not have a friend on the Comstock. Well, except for his court-appointed attorney, Charles DeLong. Sadly, it would be over with before he knew it. But then, there were those good, pious women of Virginia. Disgusting lot. They showered him with gifts of food to praise him for my murder. <laughs> they were worse than any murderer. Why, they would never get their hands dirty doing the deed, but they sure didn't mind somebody else doing it. Hypocrites, all of them. And the worst of the lot was that Bowers woman right at the beginning of the line with her sweet potato pies. <laughs> Whether or not John Millian was my murderer, he was doomed to hang for it anyway. As I said, he was a foreigner, and the town was hungry for justice. He could not have had a better attorney than Charles DeLong. Yet he was sentenced to hang and the good bells of Virginia Engine Company number one peeled out over the town in celebration of his conviction. Now, Charles DeLong did manage to keep him alive for just about one more year, taking the case all the way to the Nevada Supreme Court. But in the end, he was sentenced to die 1 o'clock p.m., April 24, 1868. And if any town knows how to put on a fine hanging, it's Virginia. <laughs> Why, upwards over 3,000 citizens attended, from Chinatown to all of society. Families spread out their quilts and blankets and picnicked at this joyous event. Finally, Jean-Marie Avillé, his given name, you see, held his head high, climbed the gallows steps, and delivered his last words in this world. Sadly, most in attendance did not understand French, but I understood, and he was resolute to the end, that he was not my murderer, and he even said that he was not bitter at the, his lot in life and being a victim of the times in Virginia.
it all took place in about as about the amount of time that it told me to tell you my story. So there you have it, mon chers. I did not mind leaving my world. Well, not so much anymore. But I can tell you this. I would have much preferred an overdose of laudanum to being <laughs> strangled and bludgeoned. <laughs> I do mind that Jean Maria Villain was a victim of the times of Virginia. But old Eile Bowers got her due in the end. <laughs> she died deaf and blind in a poorhouse with less to her name than I had. Jean Mullane, Jean Marie and I speak of it often as we sit late afternoons on Flowery Hill. He never did like her sweet potato pies anyway. <laughs> <laughs> cemetery up there. She's relegated to some other place. Yes, and as a matter of fact, I, I intended to allude to that, and I lost it. Father, Father Minot presided over her graveside services on Flowery Hill at Flowery Hill Cemetery. That also hard press the good, pious women of Virginia to forgive him for such an infraction. But the Flowery Hill Cemetery, which you probably will learn more about today, a little later in a lecture, was saved for the undesirables and the people who would not are not good enough for the cemetery closer to town. Now today you cannot locate my grave. Maybe a few people might in secret know and they're sworn to secrecy. But in the 1950s, the good gentleman of E. Clampus Vitus decided to move my fence over to where it could be seen from the town as a nice tourist attraction. So I am buried there with Jean-Marie of the Lane, but our grave sites are lost to eternity. Except for those who know the secret, I will help you pin them down and tickle them. <laughs> are, there, are there any other questions for Julia Poulet? No questions. I could not have answered everything. Yes. How much of the history you just gave us uh, comes from actual knowledge? Uh, I mean, I know like we don't, but some of it's been lost over the years. So you have a question for Kim Copel. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would be happy to answer that. I, for I, you. Unless you don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to give away too many of your secrets. No, either. actually, it's not secrets. This is why I do what I do because I want to inspire people to to learn more about history and and to share it. And where um, I got roped into this by another friend, she got tired of watching me play Mail Pony Express Rider. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted me to play a woman. So a prostitute, why not? <laughs> and um, s some of you know her, and she plays Eileen Bowers, so we actually wrote you know, an entire play around these two women who probably just you know, hated and despised each other. But what we did in the process, I think it took us six months that I remember, we researched everything we could get our hands on, even historic novels, for a flavor. And, and one thing that came out, a godsend for Julia Boulet, and I pronounce it Boulet, even though most of Virginia City says Boulet, is because of this research. A godsend, aside from the Nevada Historical Society, and I wasn't, gonna, wasn't going to not mention it, at the time I, didn't, I wasn't working with Arlene. Well, there was a book out by another author, and when he wrote it, um, he, he had you know, a certain amount of information, and he wrote what he knew. A woman by the name of Cece Hale, she's a, uh, she is a resident of, also of New Orleans and also of Lake Tahoe, and she spent, because she was intrigued because of the history back there, she spent 10 years researching Julia Boulay. Ships manifest, train manifest, uh, census records, family members that could have been um, related to her or were. When she found the ones that were, they provided her with documents, uh, letters, and diaries of family members. Okay, so they were able. She was able to trace her origins. 
She was born first, um, first American, uh, what am I trying to say here? If you don't have it memorized, it kind of goes. Um, <laughs> she was first generation American. Her, her mother and father were French. And she was a quadroon, which is what? Morocco. No, it's not. Oh. It's one quarter African American, as we say today, and three quarters European, French or European. She was French. Um, uh, octagoon is one eighth. A mulatto is just generally, you know, an unknown mixture of, of you know, not necessarily European. So that's why she was not very uh, happy to be referred to as a mulatto, because a quadroon was society, and that is how her uncle Jules wanted to, to um, market her. And make no mistake, he was marking her as a prostitute, just an upscale one. And she was fine with that, because when she uh, started, you know, when she left for New Orleans from, she was born in Morehouse Parish in Louisiana. When she left with him, she got on a boat and she saw all these courtesans and quadroons dressed beautifully. And again, she, you know, if she hadn't left home, she was going to be a babysitter and a cotton picker. And so she says, I want to be like that. And sure, there's, there's several women out there that, you know, it's okay. It, the, the sex thing isn't a big thing, but if it's a ticket to money and a fine life, and that, that's, that was the type of person she was. She was very precocious. So an, a long answer to your question, Susie, um, is that I, I, because Cece Hale had spent 10 years researching it, I didn't try to redo what she did. I just, I, I really saw and she did explain in her book where she found the information. And so then I used that and um, Douglas McDonald's information, information that um, Arlene and the Nevada Historical Society had um, given to me. And it is a lot of first, um, what is it called, priority? What's the newspaper? Primary source. Primary source information that cannot lie. And newspapers, big, big, big. Plus, I also read every book on prostitution during that time that I could. <laughs> My local library will never invite me back. <laughs> I called up and asked for another one. They said it's lost. <laughs> so, uh, but that was to get the idea, to get the idea, because I have chosen, including Julia, I've chosen a total of four Chautauqua characters to portray that don't have anything, that don't have a lot of history on them. So, you, so in order to bring them alive for you, I have to kind of figure out how it would have worked and present in that light. Is there any other question for Kim Coppell? Yes. <coughs> well, I guess um, the, the diseases, was it real prevalent in oh, Virginia yes. City? And what if I couldn't do anything, right? There was a lot of things that you couldn't do. There, there, a lot of diseases were treated by, you know, for women, you know, douching and with lye and things like that. It was just horrible. And yes, syphilis was a big one. You know, syphilis was a big one. That's why I chose to represent that. But there were lots of diseases. You ever go to a museum that has, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a, a exhibit on the paraphernalia used, you know, in those days. Um, just nasty looking stuff to try and take care of people with diseases. And it was, it was, it, that was, so was it going to be in a period of time, it, it would be like, it would be just a, a matter of time before? Yes. Or luck? Uh, it will, not, there wasn't a lot of luck, some, some of them were lucky. Um, for me, as a matter of fact, in, in part of the research I did, or Julia, uh, Julia's life, is in the, like December and January, she was visiting Dr. Green quite a bit. And Dr. Green, uh, ironically, ended up being, you know, was a coroner, too, so took care of her body afterwards. <laughs> she was visiting him quite a bit. He was kind of trying to get her to get off the alcohol and the laudanum. But if she was going to him to be treated, it wasn't for that. So she probably had something. Because it was a matter of time. It was just a matter of time. So if she wasn't murdered, how many more years would she have lived? So these men were bringing it home to her family. Sure they were. Yeah. Yeah. And some, some women were not having sex with their husbands because they knew where their husbands were. Oh, you know, they'd already married them, had the kids, that let the men go play, and then they weren't, they weren't doing anything. You know, it's Victorian times, some of those women were taught that, you know, it, it, you're not a good girl if you have sex. And that's why these men, you know, were going, you know, they weren't bad, no, they weren't bad men, they just had a need and their wives, you know, were trying to be Victorian, you know. Yes. Um, is your other character Charlie Parker yeah. and um, Ms. Boulay contemporaries or no? They could have uh, passed, they could have known each other. Let me think really quickly. No, 
No, they wouldn't, because Charlie was out of, um, Charlie Parker's was out of Virginia City by the time Julia showed up. They, yeah, maybe they could have um, crossed paths, but it wouldn't have been significant. Charlie Parker's was a contemporary of Hank Monk. And Hank Monk, the famous stagecoach driver, was a good friend of Julia's, by way of Julia's good friend, Annie Smith. Yes. I had one more question about the murder. Um, is there any other suspects, or was he just the person? That yeah, yes, there was. And I, you know, if you guys didn't want to sit here for three hours, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I meant, <laughs> I'm, I'm so to, big on history. I should. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad you asked. That's what this is for. No, no, cut me off when they want to get me out of here. But um, no, I, 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 don't take me wrong. It's just that's why I love the question part of it because you just can't fit everything in without it turning into a lecture. Yes, there are other suspects. Remember, I mentioned. Um, uh, my dear friend, um, or, or uh, the murder, or the violent death of my dear friend, Jesse Lester. Mm -hmm. Jesse Lester was attacked by, um, I can't remember, if was, he went by Chris Christensen, uh, Christian something Crittenden, I can't, I, I've lost the name right at this moment, but she, she was attacked by him, mm -hmm. and um, he cut her so badly that they had to amputate her arm, and she died from that. She died, she never recovered. And so um, he was on the loose, and Thomas Peasley, who was alive at the time, and Julia and a few of the other people, I think Cat Thompson was one of them, managed to get him brought in and convicted, and he was in prison. In th those days, you didn't serve a long time in prison. Mm -hmm. He had just gotten out around that January, early January, so they thought he could have done it. They, uh, you know, then there was the Douglas and Dylan, and then um, they thought that a rival of Thomas Peasley might have come back, and that was kind of that was kind of a long stretch. But they, they like met right away, and they were going to go hang somebody, <laughs> and and it wasn't you know they didn't find anybody until simultaneously. Here goes Millen or uh, uh, M Million, yeah, because because believe it or not, somebody transposed his, his name when he started writing it down because it is Jean Marie Avilaine. But it is John Millian, so somebody screwed it up, and that's you know hard for me to remember. But it was when he started shopping her stuff around Gold Hill that oh. Annie Smith's um, sister recognized the watch and went. And then there was a dress pattern and things like that. And so just about the time everybody was going to come in and tell on him, they found him in jail. He had just been arrested for you know just for attacking a woman. So they. Hell, they had their guy. Why look any further? <laughs> you know, that's the new yeah. um, The clothes, do they, were they from Paris to trends? Were they there? Was there a lot of competition that's with the women like there is today? Yes. Did that's see things and very stuff? good question. Um, Julia, the one I want to point out is that she only had 800, her, her, her valuables were only worth $875. She had a little bit of money under her bed, but she didn't. You know, the, the whole thing about her being wealthy, she was m able to be more be benevolent at times, but she you know, she fared better than the prostitutes that, that either were, you know, really right out there on the streets or ones that worked for, like, you know, Cad Thompson or whatever who would take, or had pimps who would take part of the money. She could afford to rent her own place, but she didn't have a lot of money because she had a, a taste for good look, for clothes and nice things. She always has. Remember, you know, when she was 15. So she would buy a lot of these things, but, but some of the prostitutes would align themselves with the local mercantile stores, and when a new dress pattern would come in for, you know, for the model, well, Julia really was five foot two, and she was that 18-inch waist. I'm a far cry from that. But those dress patterns would fit her and some of the other ladies quite often. So she had very nice clothes, and she could buy them reasonably. Um, there was a lot of competition. Also, I. The question hasn't come up yet, and I, I tell you, I don't know. I've never seen a monetary amount for what she made. But I'm sure she made better than some of the others. Plus, if some people couldn't afford to pay, they would give her something nice. So a lot of her things did come as gifts. Mm -hmm. Or she had from better days, like in Weaverville, you know, or New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was competition, and she always dressed. She never went out of the house, you know, underdressed. So she had nice things. but. You know, it, it, she didn't have an estate or anything like that. Were there any other questions? Yes. Who were your other characters that you've studied? Oh, that I, that I play? Um, well, I started out with Warren Upson, Pony Express rider, and he rode from Sportsman's Hall and Pollock Pines um, all the way to Genoa at first, and then later just to Lake, just Lake Tahoe. Um, I also portray, besides Julie Boulet, Boulet, 
now I get confused. Um, I portray Lillian Virgin Finnegan, who was the originator of the Genoa Candy Dance. And then I portray Charlie Parker, who was a stagecoach driver. And um, I was, my biggest fear today was to come in here and start, um, to start out as Julia and end up as Lillian. <laughs> Going to work well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, is it known if she ever kept a list of her clientele? I nobody has found one as far as I know, because it hasn't turned up as as far as I know. Maybe there was a list and uh, somebody had it and it was lost to time, or or nobody knew eventually who whose it belonged to. You would think she might, wouldn't you? You would think she might? Oh, excuse me, just hold this one and I'll give you. Yes. Um, do you know if there was use of condoms in that time? Yes, there was, but they weren't very reliable. They were made from like um, um, sheep intestines or yeah. animal intestines. Yeah. So, you know, it still would feel good, but it wasn't too, you know, durable. And so that wasn't the best method to go. But in the trade, they would use that. Yes, they would use that. And they, they, um, there were some other things, and I can't, I don't want to describe those. Yes, they did use condoms. Yes. How long does it take you to get the information and become the character? How, how this one took about six months, and then I opened my big mouth, <laughs> and I was asked if I could do a, a do something today. And I'm thinking, yeah, Charlie Parker's not scary. You know, <laughs> Lily Virgin, definitely not scary. Um, and uh, Warren Upson, not scary. So I thought, oh, you know what? I was going to start going into... Um, the murder and the controversy around it. And so I thought, well, that would fit today. So um, to add the million information, um, I, I'm moving right now and doing other things, and I kicked it in gear and literally just finished memorizing it like Monday. Oh. <laughs> so if you saw me kind of, you know, stop there. It was like, I, you know, thankfully I have a photo, not a necessarily photographic memory, but I see, I see my paragraphs. And I just had to see where I was, you know. But that, this one, I kicked it in gear because I didn't have anything scary or dark or, you know, this time of year. Yeah. Yes. Have you thought about working with Sandy to find the grave? Uh, yeah, well, we can. We have. We would have to get an ATV up there, and Sandy's as busy as I am, so we have kind of talked about that. But we have to get, you know, hike up there, get an ATV to get up there because there's no longer a road. But that would be quite interesting, wouldn't it? And it. Yes. Where did she live, and is it still in existence? It is not still in existence, but we know where she lived. Union Street, if, if you're right there on C Street and Union Street, it'd be the north, it'd be on the north side, so that was the Fredericks building, and that was, you know, it had different things in there at different times, but it was a hotel and probably a little bit of a prostitution, you know, off uh, place. And then when you go down the street, you would take a left on D Street and go in and on the northeast side of the street, you would go in maybe two or three buildings. It used to be an old shoe shop and she was able to rent it. It was just two, it was just two rooms. So she would bathe and have her, bathe at her friend Gertrude's and have her friend Gertrude, you know, fix her breakfast and dinner. She wasn't much into, you know, cooking. And so it, it that and the Fredericks building and Cad Thompson's brick house, all that stuff disappeared in 1875 with the big fire. So, but that's where it was. And there's still some crypts down there that you can see some examples of the week around. But that's where she lived, yeah. Any other questions? Well, you know what, thank you all for coming here today and sitting in this room and listening to me.